Hey folks, so last week was another one of those episodes where I just kept babbling on and on and on. We were talking about one-on-ones with managers when you're managing managers. How do you approach that differently than the one-on-ones we've talked about more generally? So this week we're going to bring that home and we're going to get to the second part of that series. Uh, and then we're going to maybe take a little bit of a break from the managing manager series. We'll, we'll see what happens. But anyway, this is part two, and we're going to drop right into it, and we're going to get right back into where we left off. So please enjoy. <music> One lens that I think about is urgency, and another lens that I think about is the types of things that we're talking about. So for urgency, I usually ask myself the question, how important is it that we resolve this thing right now? And connected to that, how bad would it be if the thing we're talking about is not resolved? And we've talked about this in earlier episodes. If you have these two questions, you can plot them out and you can figure out urgency importance as a, as a very important thing for how you engage in coaching on a specific topic. And what, what I think we need to add here for managers is another dimension, which is the maturity of the manager and the approach that, that means that you should be taking, depending on, for the task relevant maturity, where on their learning trajectory are they? So basically, if you have somebody that comes to you with, with an urgent task that isn't super important, we know that we can use that to build organizational capability. However, we also know that we need to foster uh, clarity and we need to foster motion. So how do we manage these two competing concerns a little bit? Like, do you want to let this thing linger on so that your team member can, can have growth through it with this idea that your organization is going to grind to a halt unless you're making fast decisions? Well, you need to apply a bit of a sorting mindset in your head and say, where are we with this specific problem relative to this individual's growth and which tooling should I apply for that specific scenario? You can, on the one hand, the most sort of laid back version you can do in a one-on-one -on -one is coach. If coaching isn't working, you can mentor. If mentoring isn't working, you can direct. And if directing isn't working, you can intervene. Coach, mentor, direct, intervene are the four different things that you can do in a one-on-one -on -one or as a knock-on for the one-on-one. -on -one. If somebody is inexperienced and it's urgent, but it doesn't matter all that much uh, if, it, if it goes to hell, then you need to let your gut on, on their experience lead you to figure out if you could coach or if you should mentor. If it's something that can completely go to hell if it's done wrong, then you should go to direct and you might need to go to intervene. So what these four distinct things mean is, you know, with coaching, it's all about asking questions to unlock answers within the person that you're talking to. So your job as a manager is to probe and, and prod with questions that, you're, um, that is really just based on unlocking something within the person. Mentoring is going one step further and being a little bit more, hey, there's this thing that you can try out, there's this thing that you can try out, what are you thinking about that? So apply a little bit more of your own experience, be a little bit more leaned in. The downside of this is that you constrain the option space a little bit, which is also, frankly, the, the upside of it, because it means that you'll get to resolution faster, but you might limit the learning of a direct report. The jump from mentorship to direction is, is more dangerous and more staggering. And what that is, is basically you go from saying, hey, here's our, some methods that you could try for solving this, to saying, do these things to solve it. And if that doesn't work out, then you're forced to go uh, to intervention, which means you jump in yourself into a space and then try to solve it. This is the most invasive way that you can work with your team. Um, and I try to avoid it unless and this is an important unless, unless I feel that the, the reason they're not making progress is my fault because there's context that should be provided at my level or there's something that I haven't done that I need to do, then I can intervene. But then I'm, it's not really the same thing because I'm intervening on behalf of myself, not on behalf of my direct report. If I need to intervene on behalf of my direct report, to me, that's like a pretty serious uh, flag that we need to have a more 
deeper conversation about things because they're not able to do the job that they've been given. So that really goes to another point in, in using this framework, using these four boxes. Uh, and that is, how often do you hear the same problem? If you're hearing some version of the same problem week after week after week, you need to start moving to the right in this framework. You also need to start ratcheting the feedback you're giving. And you need to be more directive and more clear about the feedback that you're giving if you're hearing the same problem time and time again. Say that you have an engineering manager working for you and that person keeps complaining about the relationship to the product manager and that they can't get anything done and they can't align and that the PM isn't good at doing their job or they're setting the wrong priorities. And you start by coaching them on how to approach that relationship. You then go to mentorship, which is where you lean in with your experiences on like, hey, have you tried having this conversation with the PM? Have you tried talking about having a different type of backlog meeting? Or have you tried going out and uh, grabbing a coffee outside of the office with them? Uh, that doesn't work out. You go to directive. You say, I want you to set up this meeting. I want you to organize this thing. I want you to gather the group and do this. And if that doesn't work, you intervene and you say, I'm going to start coming to your meetings and sort this out. If you get to box four there, or if this type of like bucket of problem, in this case, maybe a cross-functional relationship problem keeps popping up, that's a signal for you that there is something that's a miss here that you probably need to dive into a little bit. Another point that I'm going to make, and this is maybe more on the um, evil manager side of, of things potentially, you don't always have to strive for every one-on-one -on -one feeling amazing for you and your direct report. On the contrary, it's often good to lean into pain. One thing that you're going to have to get good at, the more people you have under you, is dealing with people problems. And people problems are often painful to deal with. So if you learn to lead into pain, then you can learn more about how to deal with, with complicated people problems. And for your direct report, the meeting can really be a place where they have to feel accountable for things. And you can use this and you can ask challenging questions. You can push them. You can be tough. It doesn't have to feel great for them to come into the meeting every week. If they feel like shit coming into the meeting every week, that's not a good place to be either. But every now and then, like one of the most helpful things that you can be to your team, to your direct reports and to your organization is somebody that brings accountability and brings pressure to your team. And the one-on-one -on -one is a perfect mechanism for doing that because it's a place where you can share feedback openly without the person that is reporting to you feeling like you're punking them in an open meeting or, or giving them a bunch of shit where they, where they have to have their guard up because their direct reports or team members are in the room. So think about using the one-on-one -on -one for different things depending on uh, which context you're going into the one-on-one -on -one with. Is that, is that, is that it? Well, the, the, connecting back to what I said in the beginning, this like role modeling aspect of it is extremely important. The way you behave in the one-on-one -on -one is the way your direct report is going to feel like they can behave in their one-on-ones. They're not going to copy your behavior, but your behavior is going to set the bounds and parameters for their behavior, meaning if you display in your one-on-ones that it's okay to do X or Y, then they're going to feel it's okay to do X or Y if that's something that they naturally feel. If you push and say it's important to think about Z or W, then they're going to push on similar things as well. So reflect on, on where you're role modeling uh, in your one-on-ones. The special case of this is when, when you have somebody on your team that's complaining about somebody else on your team, you need to tread incredibly carefully those situations because you can't not listen. However, you also can't talk shit about somebody else that works for you without that having ramifications. Like you can't say, oh yeah, I agree, person X is terrible. Well, number one, because you're talking shit about your own team in front of your own team. That doesn't make you a good role model. And number two, if that's the case, then why haven't you done anything about it? If you know that they're terrible, then why aren't you addressing it? Like that's your job as a manager. And so you're uh, making yourself look bad by when, when folks on your team bring up other team members that they have issues with. So you need to tread very carefully and you need to thread the needle between uh, shutting down the conversation, which you can't do because you want to listen to the complaints of your team, 
uh, and not being too accepting of the feedback to the point where it sounds like you know exactly what they're talking about uh, and you also think your team member is terrible. You want to be able to have open conversations about performance, but you want to do it in a way where you respect the individual uh, and you do it in a way where you don't undermine anybody on your team. I, I think that's probably it for now. There's a ton more that we can talk about in manager on manager one-on-ones. Uh, a lot of that goes into some of the more specializations that you would want to do in these meetings, like organizational planning or strategy setting or things like that. So I think it's better served for more specialized videos. And I think we've gone for long enough today. So I hope this was useful to you. And it's as always a real pleasure speaking. And by the way, I've really liked all of the comments recently. I really liked having the community engage a little bit and it's given me a lot of energy to keep doing this. So, so thank you everybody for that. And please like and subscribe and share with your manager colleagues because I think there's a lot of learning we can do as a community together. Thank you so much. Have a good one.